How's it going, everyone? Um, I'm Joseph Smallzer. I am an account manager at Dell and also a volunteer at the Juvenile Temporary Detention Center here in Chicago. Um, I'm Eric Van Zanten. Uh, I work uh, with Derek, actually, at DataMade, and uh, I have been coming to Jahack Night for four years or something like that. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> So today we're going to talk about the project that we've been working on as a team for um, a little over two years now. Um, and it's titled Civic Tech, Reentry and Collaboration. And first, I wanted to start um, by thanking Shy Hack Knight for having the platform for us all to have our groups and to work on our projects, because it's not an easy thing to do in Chicago, so we do appreciate it. Um, and then secondly, thank you all. Um, time is our most precious asset that we have, and so you guys giving us your time um, and your attention, we do appreciate that. And then finally, uh, the group, our group, Access to Justice over the past two years, personally, and four years for Eric. Um, thank you all. Um, you guys all made this possible. I am just the one who's explaining the whole process. <laughs> all right, so um, the project started um, our Access to Justice project started. Um, we, we began by trying to find a way to help uh, reduce parole violations. Um, and early on in the process, it was more of a research um, of finding where the needs are, finding where we could serve um, the community best, specifically in uh, the reentry and the recidivism space. And we ran into an organization um, and project, uh, the Education um, Justice Project, and they have a reentry guide that they release every year, actually, that's, a, that's a, an amazing resource guide for reentering citizens, um, and it provides tons of resources for them. Right, and, it, and this, it's a printed book uh, that, they, that they'll print for free every year and send it to people in prison, or, or you can just write to them and have them send it to you. So it's like kind of a very old school way of receiving information. A lot of times, as soon as they print it, it's already out of date. Uh, but it's really like one of the best ways that uh, people could learn about uh, resources that were available to them once they were coming out of prison. And prison being obviously a, 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 an issue um, and a challenge that a lot of people are facing in, in the US. Um, as you see, one in three Americans have a criminal record. Um, and a lot of our states are spending more on um, prisons um, and incarceration than education. And um, the whole recidivism challenge of one in two people who, will, who have been um, incarcerated before will be reincarcerated again because of many factors that we're going to get into. Um, you know, factors that are linked to poverty, housing, education, healthcare, um, and a lot of these um, are kind of challenges that, that these people are facing. And once we found that there is a huge gap there, that's where we kind of sunk our teeth in and, and started to reach out to a lot of organizations that we're going to talk about um, and get into here. Um, great. So um, basically, what, you know, as Joe mentioned, uh, we started out sort of on this with basically a research project where we were really wanting to try and find out like who, who was in this space and like who, who was doing what and like and how effective it was or wasn't. Um, and a lot, of, a, a lot of this ended up just being, you know, just kind of talking to people, reaching out to people, uh, going and attending uh, events in, in various community uh, communities. Um, there are you know, various uh, events that like the Illinois Department of Corrections will host uh, if you're, uh, it's like a, a little job fair sort of arrangement where they, you know, take you around to different uh, providers to make sure that you have information when you're coming out of prison. Um, but they're all, they're a, a lot of times they're very clunky and they're not, they're not, they're all also not very, um, a lot of times they don't really talk to one another. So it was like uh, a lot of the, the research that we ended up doing was sort of like, uh, not only connecting ourselves with those organizations, but like ended up connecting other organizations to each other. Um, so um, a lot, we worked with a lot of people, not just like community-based uh, people, but also like um, pe people from the Shahaknet community and, as well as other, um, uh, other people that we just happened to know. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the people came to us through our, our fearless leader. Um, Kulsum, who uh, is in the audience with us tonight. <laughs> uh, but she, uh, she was like kind of instrumental in kind of like being able to, to connect us with a lot of these organizations. So, um, but yeah, there, it was a very, very huge and diverse pool of people that we worked with. 
Um, so uh, really, really, uh, you know, as we, as we were talking about this, this guide that uh, um, the, the Education Justice Project puts out um, through their, uh, it's called the Illinois Reentry Guide Initiative. Um, they, uh, it, it's just a printed guide. Um, and it has, it, it, it's, it's written sort of like a workbook. You kind of, it kind of walks you through various kind of topic areas and, and talks about some of the things that you might face. So like, for instance, a lot of times you, you know, you know, coming out of prison, you don't have an ID. So it kind of talks about how, how you might go about getting, you know, identification when you, when you come out of prison. Um, and when we first started on this, uh, it, the scope for the project was pretty big. Um, we were, we were thinking, oh well, maybe you know, maybe what we'll build, maybe what we'll uh, you know build with you is like some kind of content management system, where you can kind of like do the editing for your guide as well, and then and then like cut a release for your guide once a year that comes out in this printed form. Um, and it was very ambitious, um, but through, kind of through the through the process of talking to them and realizing our own limitations as a as a group of volunteers uh, who met once a week. Uh, you know, at least, uh, and then also finding out eventually that the group that works on this reentry guide is also volunteers. <laughs> um, and, and one kind of big point that we haven't mentioned yet is they're also based in Urbana-Champaign. Um, <clears throat> uh, that it, it, it became pretty clear that we were going to need to kind of like winnow down the scope of this project a little bit and try and, try and figure out what was, what was an easy chunk to bite off and what would, what would make sense for a website. Um, so um, my, the company that I work for happened to uh, have already kind of built a, a similar tool for um, the Shriver Center, with the, with the Shriver Center and actually the um, Juvenile Parole. Uh, juvenile Parole, is that right? Yeah. Over, at, over at Cook County. Um, and they, they, it was a very similar kind of concept, but it was built for parole officers rather than for parolees. Um, so like the focus of it was a little bit inverted, um, but, it, but it, like all the, all the basic elements were there. And, and so we were able to take th that project but, and, and because it was open source, we were able to just use the source code um, for it and, um, and like already kind of hit the ground running. Um, the tech is super simple. It's like a, a you know, entirely, it's hosted on GitHub pages. <laughs> It's an entirely, you know, static client-side app. Um, the 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 dynamic parts of it are are uh, just pulling in data from a Google spreadsheet. So it's like we we basically wanted to build something that kind of complemented the workflow that was already uh, in place with the Education Justice Project. They were already using spreadsheets to manage these lists of resources, um, and uh, and and it was free. They don't have to worry about. Uh, um, hosting it or anything like that. Um, yeah, and, and sort of like, I guess, I guess one kind of big, uh, the, part of the reason why, uh, you know, this project, we've been working on this project for something like two years is because, uh, it's not only because of that kind of volunteer element, but, but it was because we were really, we were really focused on trying to make this uh, a, a project or a product that, um, that, Actually served the people that we intended to serve with it. So um, we did a we did a we hosted a lot of events, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And and we also really, uh, you know, tried to trying to tune it and tried to actually remove things as we went along to make it less complicated and, and more refined. Um, so. That's it. <clears throat> oh, okay. And now we get to do a demo, a quick demo. It's going to be a quick demo. Okay. So that, this is it, this is the site. Uh, it's at map. right now it's at map.reentrycolab.org. We're working on uh, an, another host name for it. Uh, but it's, it basically just uh, you know, starts with a wizard, asks a few questions um, about you know, like who, who um, you know, wh what are you looking for? Um, and, and a lot, uh, these, these uh, kind of questions came out of like, um, you know, talking to talking to individuals who had who had experienced who had faced these issues before, as well as people who were like working in organizations that provided these services. So these, you know, five questions were are like probably among the most well vetted five questions on uh, the entire thing, or five five uh, subject areas. So 
Uh, one thing that we did build is in like is like uh, you know location awareness, and but you don't you don't actually have to fill in an address. We're going to do it just because it's fun. Um, one of the things that we were really conscious of is like not wanting to make people feel like they were um, like we were intruding on their privacy at all. Um, so, uh, especially you know these are especially you know sensitive issues for for people who are like um, you know coming out of prison. So. Um, we wanted to we wanted to make sure that you didn't have to use an address or like you didn't have to put in any kind of like uh, any any uh, you know personal information if you didn't want to. So we're going to look for resources for immigrants around the merchandise market. Hopefully this turns something up. Uh, we'll say they're not incarcerated. <clears throat> so uh, here we go. So we have uh, have 40 things within five miles of of the merchandise mart. Um, and these are all these are all resources that were um, that were kind of like uh, catalog cataloged and categorized by the Education Justice Project f as part of their their uh, uh, reentry guide. Um, we we didn't do any of the data entry. We did a little bit cleanup uh, so that it would work with this website and just sort of like turn the keys over to them. Um, uh, but yeah, we've also got a map view, which is fun. Um, but it, it, it actually turned out that we originally had the map as like the main view for this, but it turned out that it was kind of more confusing for a lot of people to, to be presented with a map at first. Because they were looking for really specific kind of keywords. They were looking for, oh, okay, I see that this one is, uh, you know, Breakthrough Urban Ministries. I, I, you know, I'm not a very religious person, so maybe that's not something that is for me. Um, you know, and then also things like, you know, they. Uh, prohibit sex offenders. So if you if you have that on your if you have that on your record, then you know that's that's something to consider. Um, uh, yeah. So that that's that's kind of that's it. That's the entire thing. <laughs> um, so like you can uh, uh, you know just kind of present you with a, a a list of hopefully useful resources and, and a way to contact them. Throughout this process, you know, again, it was two years long. There were, there were a lot of kind of ups and downs, and like we got lost in the woods sometimes, uh, which which was fine. We were we were we were exploring, um, but um, you know, we really like, you know, coming from this this space right here, this room. You know, we're all we're all you know relatively, you know, well off people, right? <laughs> You know, we we come we're 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 okay coming on Tuesday nights to to merchandise mart and and hanging out together. Um, a lot of the people that we that we were hoping to serve, you know, with this with this website are not people that would ever come uh, to merchandise mart on a Tuesday night. Nor nor would they maybe even be able to. Um, so a lot of uh, a lot of what we had to do is like seek out organizations and seek out opportunities elsewhere, not here. That, that where we could talk to people and, and get their feedback. Um, we, we chose to work with the Education Justice um, Project because they were well respected when we were, when we were kind of researching other things. Um, they, they were kind of an organization that kept coming up. Actually, their main, their main project is, is doing um, college level courses in like Dan, Danville State Prison and um, stuff like that, and they actually have like degree programs that you can go through. Um, but they they're like a very well respected uh, organization, and their guide is like pretty well researched, and they they're it's do a lot of diligence to put it together. Um, you know, and and as I mentioned before, everybody was a volunteer. You know, on our team as well as on their team. Um, so uh, we had to we had to find you know. Uh, you know, as a personally as a technologist, you know, I'm I'm like yeah, I, get, I can be I can go a little bit crazy uh, with over engineering things. Um, so you know, it it was it, it you know it was a challenge to kind of like find find a way to make something that was simple that they could use that they could actually maintain themselves that like that was going to be uh, also useful for everyone involved. Um, and and like along with that, we had to find ways of meeting. Uh, with an organization who was based in Urbana-Champaign, um, we and and like uh, we there were sometimes when they would drive up here and 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 meet with us. At, you know, God bless them. They would you know drive up uh, you know after work like race up the highway and meet us somewhere in the on this uh, 
in a in a room in the south suburbs somewhere, uh, and then and then like race back before you know it got too late. Um, and then you know sometimes there were some serendipitous opportunities where they just happened to be in town. Um, other than that, we just did everything on the phone. But it was it was uh, it was a learning process to figure out how to work with some work with an organization that was that was remote. And, and like we said in the beginning, we're, we've been meeting for a little over two years, and, and, and with our group, we had access to over 20 plus organizations that are currently serving um, the people that we're trying to additionally serve. So we were able to gather a lot of that information. Um, and over those two years, I'm sure you know, some people, um, some volunteers that we have on our team um, have come for a couple sessions or a few sessions or a few months. And, and, and all of those people, even if they've been here for one session or two or 20, have contributed uh, massively to what we are able to show you guys right now. And similar to um, you know, what, what Eric said earlier, but we were able to attend a lot of events to gather as much information because going into this personally, my expertise is in making assumptions um, based on my background, based on my schooling, is, is that's what I'm good at. I'm good at getting results from that. And I had to completely shut that off because things that I assume were not at all applicable to what we were trying to do. Um, some things offended people that we were trying to do. So it was a big, big, big learning process for me and I'm sure a lot of other people. Um, and flipping that assumption and, and taking a step back and, and, and being vulnerable and being open um, to everyone that we were interviewing, talking to, um, having events. Um, like for example, our Impact-a-thon, uh, which was hosted in Englewood, where we brought together a lot of um, re-entering citizens, um, also people and organizations that are serving those people, and then our team members. Um, we got together and, and did some ideation and, and threw some ideas around and categorized those ideas to help um, get a better idea of what exactly is the focus, what the focus needs to be. Because going into it, we had ideas and assumptions which were, um, at least for me, completely wrong. <laughs> yeah. Well, and those, those events too, one big thing, uh, as I kind of glossed over a little bit earlier, is like um, a lot of these organizations are, are kind of, you know, we would go around and everybody would introduce themselves and talk about a little bit about what their organization was doing. As, and as, the, as, a, as they went around, a lot of times they were like, oh, wow, you know, that, that guy who I've kind of maybe vaguely heard about before is pretty much doing the same thing as I'm doing in a different neighborhood. So, like, it was very interesting to see, like, just, just by virtue of the fact of like stumbling into this and being willing to provide a space for people to get together, um, there, there was like a lot of positive benefit, just like, like not, not even related to us, you know, people, people getting together and talking, so. Yeah, exactly. And then after Impactathon, we hosted two other um, kind of main events where we were able to do one user testing of the initial um, product that we had, uh, the service that we had, the website that we have to just get some more feedback and again, those assumptions were blown out of the water and the feedback that we got, um, we used to iterate the whole process um, and into what it is now. And then here's just a couple photos of, this is the Impactathon. Um, and as you see, we had the, the sticky notes just to help categorize what ideas, what thoughts people had throughout the, the event that we hosted. And um, the attendance was great and we couldn't have asked for anything better. And um, I think that was one of the things that really showed us that there is a huge need um, that, that a lot of people are currently serving and, and also needs as many people as, as, as possible to help continue serving and pushing um, this process. This, this event happened to have been held the weekend after the presidential election in 2016, so it was like particularly, uh, it was a particularly interesting event. <laughs> and then some of the takeaways. Um, uh, relationships, obviously that, that was the biggest, I think, in my opinion, takeaways that we have. We were able to develop relationships with these communities, with these organizations that were serving the communities, with our team members, um, with Shy Hack Night members. Um, so again, across age, culture, profession, and neighborhoods, because um, that's kind of what's necessary to having a successful, um, in my opinion, uh, project is to get as many diverse um, opinions and mindsets and, and thought processes as possible. Um, to make sure everyone's being served. And then challenges, Eric touched on it, no paid staff, um, you know, starting with a project management system, which is where we initially wanted to do it, but then figuring out where the focus is based on all those events that were attended, based on the feedback that we collected. And then the hybrid map model of Shy Hack Night. So this is 
basically, most of the time I think that we spent as a team was not inside Shy Hack Night. We actually were, um, you know, whether it was we were in Champaign, some people were in Champaign, some people were um, on the, in the south side or other um, areas where we were getting together. Um, so, so that was one, one, one thing that I reflected on of what made it kind of a hybrid model. And then again, many relationships built and, and again, the minimal assumptions which I touched on. Um, that was something that I think a lot of people uh, shared and, and also agreed with. And, and then the last line, um, this, I kind of threw this in here because when I was putting together this presentation, um, I think a week ago or so, I kind of reflected on um, my first time coming here, which is probably exactly two years ago. It's when I started my volunteering at the Juvenile Center. And then I think two days after that, I came here and found that there was a group forming that was doing the same exact thing, um, you know, just for, for, for people that were um, incarcerated and not necessarily juvenile. Um, so it was uh, a perfect storm, or however you want to call it. but. Um, it allowed me to change what I normally did of being in a corporate world and, and serving, not serving, and, 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 and uh, fulfilling, I guess, yeah, business needs, business wants, um, and maybe some human wants. And I never really dipped into serving the human needs, which I think is what brings all of us here today, um, is, is really a focus on that and an understanding of how important that is um, in the world and in our lives. So that was one of the big takeaways that I had. And, yeah. I just wonder if you're tracking the traffic to the website and uh, what areas are more used and how do you measure the effectiveness of uh, the project? Um, yeah, I guess we had, <laughs> yeah, I guess we haven't really, um, we hadn't really thought about how to, you know, measure the effectiveness other than like trying to, um, uh, trying to talk to people who were using it, more like qualitative versus quantitative uh, uh, effectiveness, I guess. Um, yeah, I, we have, I, I don't know if we have Google Analytics hooked up, we might, uh, but I think that would be it. Um, I, I guess there's not a lot of, right now, because you know, we are a volunteer group and like Education Justice Project is like a very, they're very focused on an entirely different mission and this is sort of a side project that they do. I don't know like what the capacity is amongst our two groups to actually do anything with, with, uh, with that kind of information right now. So I don't know. It would be it would be kind of interesting, but I, I think at the same time, um, we weren't we weren't really trying to like hit, you know, specific like you know, ten thousand clicks per month or whatever. You know, it's just sort of like this is a tool that exists, and if it helps one person, great. Hey, from the doc, what are the tools that are used, and what skills are needed to help? Um, it's it's a, a Jekyll, I'm pretty sure, a Jekyll website. Um, it's which it has like three pages or something like that. <clears throat> um, and there's a lot of a lot of tricky JavaScript. Um, and uh, Google spreadsheets, I guess, is, is are the three skills. Um, that's that's the uh, that's the answer. <laughs> I like JavaScript, so you mentioned on the lot of tricky JavaScript. Can you give at least one sample of one aspect of JavaScript that you use? Um, yeah, I think I think we have like <clears throat> um, I think here, hold on, sorry. Uh, let's let's see if I do this right. And while he's pulling that up, uh, the last question about what skill sets. Um, it, it, it's it's. Everyone has different expertise coming to Shy Hack Night, so um, I think to answer that question, as many skill sets as possible, because it's not necessarily just a developing need, it's not necessarily just an engineering need, it's um, an empathy need, it's a experience need, um, it's a patience need, so a lot of things that, um, that a lot of people have different expertise in is what made our group, um, I think, as successful as, as, as we were at the end. I'm yeah, so we have an organization on GitHub it's called Reentry Colab. <clears throat> it's got two things. <laughs> this is the URL that we're hoping to shift to is reentryillinois.net. But this is this is the source code for the for the website. And you can see here it's you know forked from from this other project that DataMade worked on. So it's like pretty straightforward. The, all the JavaScript is in the JS folder. It's not, it's really I when I say tricky. But it's not tricky, believe me. <laughs>
I've seen trickier. <laughs> An assumption I would make is that the number of services available in different geographic locations varies widely. So um, I'm wondering if this kind of tool would help somebody potentially relocate or find services if they're lacking in their current location and if a potential future plan for this project would be to kind of help people relocate to an area where they would be able to better re-enter society. Yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure of the rules around that. Um, I, I could imagine that the state probably has rules around that, well, like where you can relocate and stuff like that. Um, but like, yeah, there is, there is like if you look at certain communities downstate, it's like, it's maybe like one food bank or something like that is all, is all we have. Um, but it's, and it's it like, uh, it's, a, it's a constant problem too of like trying to figure out if these services even like offer what they say they do anymore. Um, which is like uh, is a problem that um, uh, EJP has, you know, they're, they're constantly trying to call around to people and see if they're still open, you know, especially when, when the state didn't have a budget for a couple of years, it was like there were places closing down left and right. So, but yeah, that's, that's a good idea. Hello, my question is um, those resources on the website, are they refreshed uh, regularly? Um, they, they certainly could be. <laughs> I don't, I, like I say, we, uh, we, we set this up um, in a way so that, so that the, the, the content, the people who are like curating the content can do it on their own. Uh, so we don't, I haven't really looked. I know that uh, one, of, one of our team members uh, actually last week or last, yesterday, uh, we were looking at this and uh, we noticed that they had gone through and like tagged up a bunch of stuff. So they're, they're definitely in there, and they're definitely tweaking things and editing things, um, you know, pretty regularly. So. Have you guys found that it's actually the end user using the website, or is it more like the nonprofits that are serving this population, or or social workers? Um, yeah, I guess I guess it's not entirely clear right now. Um, it, it, like I, like I said, we're, we're not really seeking to collect information about people who are using the website just because we kind of find it a little bit invasive. Um, but it's, a, a lot of the people that we've talked to are people who are like uh, service providers. Um, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if those are like the people who are largely using it right now. Um, there's, and uh, you know, obviously like uh, on the other side of that, on the, on the like, um, you know, people who are currently incarcerated, um, or or their families. Uh, you know that that's something that you know as as EJP is like uh, you know in, in you know teaching classes and whatnot in prison. I'm I'm sure that the word will get out. It's it's like a pretty new thing still. So like it, it'll hopefully it'll hopefully it'll get out there. <laughs> one, one other question, kind of just around um, I guess where you see as the next phase of the project. And what are some of the key needs, uh, like infrastructure capacity, that you guys are maybe thinking through? I don't know. <laughs> We've been working on this for two years, and I think a lot of us are kind of ready to move on to another thing. Um, so I hadn't really thought about it very much. Uh, but but if you if you have ideas, or if you know other people who have ideas, you know we'd we'd be certainly interested in and in, you know talking about you know connecting you with the people that we've connected with and and like and helping you. Uh, you know, get going because it's it's an exciting project and and needs to be kept going. There's a, a question in the doc. What do you mean by crossing imagined and constructed boundaries in the slide? If you remember wow, that slide. I don't, do you remember that slide? <laughs> I thought we removed that one because it's a complicated <laughs> thing to unpack. Do you want to? Um, and, and, and it's kind of yeah. Close <laughs> Hey, Kosa. I'm not a technologist. I was an English major. <laughs> um, really, to me, one of the most powerful aspects of our project was we live in one of the most segregated cities in the world, and that segregation is deeply, deeply steeped in laws and policies, and there's something powerful and transformative about actually leaving the spaces geographically, ideologically, culturally that we're comfortable with and being in new spaces and building relationships. And so that's what I meant, both constructed boundaries, like literally 
the <laughs> the policies that have shaped our neighborhoods in the city were were written by human beings, right? And yet we experience them in tangible, practical ways in terms of the allocation of resources, in terms of safety, and in terms of the constructed piece. I, I can go on for a long time about this, but but it's important to me that we talk about this because I see Shai Hacknight as a non-technologist, as a non-project manager. A lot of why this project took so long is because I didn't really have the requisite skills to lead a project or a tech project or, an, or this type of interdisciplinary project. But what I do have skills in is building community. And I see this as a space with profound potential for people from a lot of different backgrounds to work on some of the most impactful issues. When you think about one in three people, that's a seismic statistic, right? And there are plenty of issues like that, student loans, mass incarceration, issues that maybe not every person in this room has experienced or the people you love have experienced, but the vast majority of people in our metropolitan area are impacted by these issues. And so that to me is the power of crossing these boundaries, is, is galvanizing the resources in this room across our disciplines to work on these deep, deep issues that have long-term implications for the folks directly impacted and then all of us who share a common humanity. So that's what I meant by that, by that phrase. One of the questions I have is, um, in your experience with people accessing this resource, the print version versus this website, especially when people are coming out, whether or not they have access to the internet, um, to IT, like is it mobile compatible, is it distributed in libraries, or like how do people access it generally in your experience? Yeah, so um, I think the, the more outlets of, of a resource you have, the better. Um, so that's kind of what we had in mind. Um, I think, unfortunately, peop more people have access to the internet than running water. I think that's a stat that's been out there. Um, so, so focusing on that might, uh, long term, might be a, a reliable resource. But um, do you know the mobile compatibility of it yet? Um, yeah, I mean, like, it's pretty okay. It does okay. <laughs> um, but like, but it's it's uh, you know we we does, we we made some traces and and it's it, it works on a phone, pretty well. Um, but like the 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 printed guide is like um, it, it, it's you know like I said it's just mailed out to to people and I, and it's a, it's much more comprehensive actually and they they went to like it's it's a beautiful thing to to see this they they did a really good job. Sure. So my question is super simple. Um, I work, worked for non for profits for about ten years now. I know that that system most likely is, they're used by service providers, and I'm just curious. Because I know you got the moved on from the project. Uh, what are some of the ways that you can make the interface more uh, appealing, I guess, to people who are coming out? Because uh, just even the use of it, the functionality, you know, they'll get lost in that. Uh, and I think it's very important as we're going out and we're building new t systems and delivering new services to empower people. Because what tends to happen is you have advocates, and these people go out and they speak on their behalf, as if the people who are you're servicing, they don't have the ability to speak on their own behalf. So to empower them, I know you guys have moved on, but what are some of the ways you think that you can improve on what you've made uh, to anybody that's coming behind you to take that and to, to build upon it? Uh, it's tricky. Um, this Koso wants to talk. Koso, yeah. Oh, you got it? Thank you. Thank you very much for that. That's a really important point, and it's something we struggled with throughout the project, which was how do you reach, and to your point as well, sir, the end user, the person actually experiencing the issue. One piece is that reentry is one of the few spaces, and I'm also from the nonprofit sector, uh, where you actually have the folks who've experienced the issue working in the field, which is pretty distinctive for the nonprofit sector. But there is, there's this deep systemic challenge of how do you work directly with the folks most impacted and how do you build empowerment in. So those are things that we spent a lot of time talking about, thinking about, but we're open to suggestions and ideas for moving forward. We tried to sort of uh, take, take the project out into community as much as possible. And so the user testing we did was with folks who themselves had experienced the issue and were re-entering. And all, all of the events we're talking about, these discussions, these dialogues, included folks who themselves had experienced the issue. But there's also a huge tech challenge here. And this is an example of where the tech augments the written guide, but it doesn't supplant it, right? Because the written guide is going to make it to the gas station in East Garfield Park in ways that the website is not. And so there is this potential, this tremendous potential in, 
enhancing the scope and the reach and the accessibility and the updating and sustainability through the tech piece, but it's in tandem with the fact that we do have a broadband disparity in this city. We do have folks who can't even pay a basic cell phone. <laughs> And a lot of those folks happen to be people who were previously incarcerated. And so the, your, your points are very well taken and they're challenges that we're grappling with. And um, we're very open to folks who wanna come in and step in and take on and push forward. Um, so we're not certain about what iteration. Most of our folks are tapped out, but go ahead. I will say that I work for an organization and uh, they actually created an application to put on a smartphone. And it was like, okay, go well, great. And then the person, the executive director, he actually bought all these iPhone 6s and you put the application on the phone, you can deliver them. The problem is it's not sustainable because I mean like it's iPhone 6 are like 800 bucks and you know, talking about servicing 1,200 people within a year. And so long story short, the business that I was working for for four months went out of business. Uh, and I guess it's like, okay, well, because these people also have a technology deficit too. They don't, they don't want to use it. How do you then take that uh, and find ways to get it to them? Because this is the way to do it because people have, booklets at home that, you know, these people get packets as they're leaving prison and they don't use them. Like, they'll tell you, like, you know, they have a fat pack of uh, different resources and they take it and they kind of, you know, put it somewhere. And so I guess, like, just thinking about, like, how do you get these resources to people uh, and also uh, the mediums in which they can use something like this. Uh, because if you work through a social worker, it's like, great, I'm telling this person about it or I'm doing it for them and then when I go on and, like, Go about my business. This person is still kind of in the situation that they are in. But yeah, that's just kind of another. Oh, just I, I appreciate so. your points. Yeah. These are endemic issues in the social sector that we don't often talk about and unpack deeply. Number one and number two, there's a piece around incentivization and the financial reality of the real world, right? And 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 when we think about entrepreneurship, and I think someone introduced himself as a capitalist. Like, let's think about what models we're employing and when and where and what vernacular and who is in those spaces, right? So if I can call my cousin who is a venture capitalist and be like, hey, I have another great idea for a restaurant delivery app. But if I have that sort of access, that becomes a brilliant, creative, innovative example and model. But you could be on the ground having been one of the most resilient people and gone through 25 co-linked issues but that, in this, we live in a society in which that is not easily, that type of creativity and innovation and resilience is not easily monetized. So that's what this space can be, in my opinion, is linking those sorts of resources in thoughtful ways through provocative questions and iteration and failure. And my, my friends and colleagues are being very gracious, but this was a tough project for me and for everybody else. But there's still lessons to be learned from this and beauty to be found in it and impact to be had. And so this piece also around measurement and evaluation, we talked about that. We were like, does anybody know how to do this for free? <laughs> and then we talked about like Google Analytics or whatever that stuff was. <laughs> um, and so there's also just like inherent limitations of not having access to monetary resources or paid staff. Like I work 80 hours a week sometimes at my nonprofit job. I barely get paid for 40, very barely, you know? So these are some of the inherent limitations of, of doing social impact work. But I appreciate your questions because they're very important, very thoughtful, and I really wanna give a shout out to my colleagues. And I have zero, no, I have one friend named Joe, he's standing there. And Joe has one friend named Kulsum, and I was at his wedding and I'm sitting here. And that's a powerful thing in this city, right? It's not a simple thing and it's not a thing to be lightly dismissed, but it's emblematic of the type of relationships we can build, the types of experiences we can combine, and the types of hard questions we can ask each other. So I appreciate your points. I wanted to uh, thank you guys for all your hard work. Um, I actually was not aware of any of this until today, so this is an eye-opener for me. Um, one thing I was gonna bring up is, and I'll reiterate what was already said, um, we cannot ever assume that others don't have a phone or don't understand technology. We are dealing with um, a large amount of, there's a huge gap here when it comes to uh, disenfranchised Americans. Um, we have seniors that are coming out of the system as well, like with what you guys are working with. Um, there's a lot of assumptions made every day by many people, all the way up in law. Um, one thing I noticed is trying to get legal help, you're given a list. A lot of times the, the, they'll give you a list and say, well, the prisoner needs to, here, here's places for them to call. 
So you get this long list, two, three, five, ten pages. More than half of these places don't answer, and the rest of them don't do it. So there's, there's also, when they're trying to get help, there's medical help and so on and so forth that they're supposed to receive. They make calls to these places and their insurance or medical cards. No, a lot of these people end up on the streets, and that's a huge problem. It affects everybody. Everybody in our country, I believe, if you've succeeded in something, then reach back. Reach back, pull someone forward, and keep going. Um, I just, I applaud you guys. Thank you. There's some folks here that worked on access to this Access to Justice project. Yes, Could everybody in the room stand up like half of, uh, who worked on this project? And there were many, 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 many more. Yeah.